Um, but let's get started. So the plan is uh, this last part we added, and then uh, we actually move this to tomorrow. So uh, ignore the third bullet point there. So the plan is I'll give a sort of introduction to this. Uh, different approaches uh, for integrating tracker and aggregate data, when, why it's useful. Uh, and then Claude will give uh, an introduction to this new uh, Apache Camel tool for doing uh, tracker to aggregate that the uh, interoperability team has developed. And hopefully we'll have time for any questions uh, towards the end. Uh, the TB uh, experiences from Pakistan will be a separate session tomorrow. Uh, so why, why is this useful to uh, think about? So the first is that uh, when we're looking at uh, data analysis of our uh, DHIS2 data, it's often useful to be able to compare data coming in both from the uh, aggregate and the tracker data model uh, together. So let's say you have an immunization registry in tracker. And then you have your monthly stock reports in aggregate data model, and you want to look, compare the immunizations with the stock data, for example. Uh, so for analytics, it's useful to have this, uh, bringing together different health programs or health uh, components. Uh, we also see in a lot of places that um, with Tracker, you often, it takes time to get the full geographical coverage. So you will often have, uh, like maybe even years where you have tracker in some facilities, some districts, um, and you have aggregate in others, and you need to have a way to look at uh, the data together in one place to get the full picture ge geographically. Uh, often we have tracker and aggregate uh, running in different DHS2 instances. Uh, and if you want to then look at uh, this together, you need to move the data from tracker into aggregate typically. And finally, which has been sort of very clear with the last uh, couple of years with uh, COVID, where we had this huge large scale uh, tracker implementations, there are performance issues um, with the tracker analytics as you reach uh, like millions or tens of millions of um, enrollments and events. Uh, so these are sort of the three approaches we have for linking tracker and aggregate data. The first is basically just to have your, if you have your data in the same database, you can pull in within uh, the same analytical uh, objects in data visualizer. You can pull in program indicators, aggregate indicators, data elements in one, um, one visualization, so you can make separate charts, put them together in the dashboard. Uh, you can use the aggregate indicators uh, to combine um, program indicators, aggregate data elements, for example. And finally, you can actually export your tracker data as aggregate values and save them in the aggregate data model. So I'll just speak briefly to the first two, and then the rest of the session will focus on the third one, which I think is what uh, most people think of when we're thinking of uh, tracker and aggregate um, together. So just a few examples here, uh, where we have, for example, um, COVAC data uh, combining uh, program indicators with um, uh, vaccine doses given and aggregate IFI reporting in one chart. So that's one example. We have a part of a dashboard there where we have the case-based uh, cause of death data together with uh, aggregate numbers on the top uh, causes of death. Uh, we also have the possibility in the aggregate indicators, like I said, to combine uh, the aggregate and tracker data models. Um, which is what you typically would need for um, doing coverages based on tracker data, for example. You would need aggregate population data together with your uh, service data coming from a tracker. Uh, but this is also possible uh, to use if you have, like I mentioned, the different geographical areas using aggregate and tracker. You can combine the numbers you want to look at in aggregate indicators. Uh, to have the full um, geographical coverage within the same uh, indicators. Uh, 
Also, if you're sort of transitioning from aggregate to tracker, you might have five years of historical data in aggregate, and then you're starting to use tracker and you have your recent data in tracker. And you can combine them then in an aggregate indicator uh, to be able to look at uh, the time series across um, this transition. But the focus here in this session will be on doing this, taking your tracker uh, case-based data uh, and producing data values for the aggregate uh, data model in DHIS2. Like I said, uh, sort of the focus on this recently has been on uh, performance because of these uh, huge COVID uh, tracker implementations that have had struggle, struggled with the uh, tracker analytics. Uh, but it's also important if you're thinking sort of from a, a health information system overall perspective where you have uh, you have your existing routines for doing the routine reporting, you're implementing tracker in a specific domain and you want to somehow bring it together. Um, so uh, also important to keep in mind is how this is actually implemented in the country. So fine, if you're only using Tracker, uh, you have your Tracker instance, that's where uh, this will happen. Um, some places you might combine your Tracker aggregate in one instance. Um, perhaps you have, uh, uh, for example, one uh, parallel instance sort of focusing on one program where you do both. But I think what is increasingly uh, sort of the norm and what is recommended is to have separate instance for tracker and aggregate. So you keep your routine reporting in one place. If you're implementing a large scale tracker, you set up a separate database for that. Uh, and then in terms of these different approaches that I've talked about, um, it's only really the third one of actually extracting your tracker data, saving it as um, uh, aggregate data values that is uh, usable in the third scenario with separate instances. So this is the one we'll focus on. Uh, so why would you want to do this? I already touched upon, upon some of this. Uh, one thing is sort of in terms of taking into account the whole sort of uh, health information architecture in the country, you want to have a place where you bring the data together, both your tracker and your aggregate. Uh, same with this facing in the tracker geographically, you would want to have a way of combining this um, during the implementation. Uh, I've touched a bit upon the data use analytics, um, but a key thing, key limitation with the tracker data model at the moment in terms of analytics is the lack of dimensionality of the data. So if you're setting up uh, program indicators to look at your, uh, to aggregate your tracker data, basically to get counts of uh, children in an immunization program or uh, confirmed malaria cases, you can make program indicators for this um, with the HDS aggregations, for example, but there is no categories in the same way as we have uh, with aggregate data. So there are ways, um, of using, using option sets, etc. But if you have, in particular, when you have aggregate and tracker data together, you want to put them in the same table. It doesn't really work because the way you disaggregate tracker data and aggregate data is different. So if you bring everything into the aggregate data model, you can have um, confirmed malaria cases under five using your category together with um, data collected as aggregate data with the same HDS aggregation in the same uh, table. Uh, and finally, this um, performance, which I'll come uh, back to uh, later as well. So there are some challenges with this. It can be a bit complicated. There is no built-in uh, functionality in DHIS2 for actually taking the tracker data and saving it as aggregate data values. Last slide will be a bit on the plans for actually building that into the core, but uh, you have to wait until the end before uh, I reveal that. Uh, so one thing is that you need a tool for actually moving the data, uh, but you also need to map your tracker uh, metadata to your aggregate data for um, 
for whatever tool you're using to know what program indicator um, is linked to what aggregate data element and um, category. And the second point will, at least for the time being, still be the case uh, when we have functionality in core for doing the actual data transfer. As soon as you have two DHS2 instances, a uh, third challenge is that you then need to keep your uh, org units in sync as well, which could be a big, uh, big or small problem depending on the implementation and how many org units uh, we're dealing with and whether there is some uh, service set up for syncing this already. So this is sort of the, an attempt to describe the data flow from the tracker data being collected until you're able to present it in uh, a data visualizer on the dashboard as aggregate data elements. So we're starting with um, tracker data coming in, being uh, saved in a few different tables in the database for enrollments, for the actual data element values, um, for the tracked entity itself. Uh, then there is the tracker analytics process, which sort of, uh, I always forget whether it normalizes or denormalizes the data to make the uh, analytics queries against this more efficient, but it's still, um, it's still not actually aggregating it, it's just making it uh, more efficient to query against. So when we define the program indicators, the example here of counting children given BCG doses that are under one year, uh, the query against the tracker analytics data still requires to actually count the rows in the database. Even though we're running the tracker analytics, we don't have that number pre-calculated uh, in the database. That's happening when you request the program indicator data. Uh, so in terms of the performance, this is the step that is problematic with these huge tracker uh, implementations. Once we have our program indicators defined, we can then from the API extract the program indicator uh, values as a data value set, which is the format DHIS uses for uh, aggregate data. And we can import it again uh, as an aggregate data element. Then we can run analytics for, on the aggregate data values and we can use that for uh, producing visualizations, maps, dashboards, et cetera. So that's sort of the, from A to Z, the process we're sort of going through with this uh, tracker to aggregate um, integration. Of course, the step import export step relies on having a mapping between the program indicator and the data element and the category option and the attribute option, if you're using that, as well as the org units. Um, and of course, if you're then changing anything in your tracker or aggregate uh, configuration, you need to make sure that this keeps uh, synchronized. So depending a bit on how the tracker and aggregate system is implemented in the country, there are a few options. Of course, if you only have one tracker instance, you would typically then do this either because you need uh, for performance reasons or because you want to use some of the dimensionality in the analytics. If you have separate tracker and aggregate instances, uh, there's sort of two options. One is to try to do this um, export and import in two different instances. So you have your tracker instance, you do the extraction of the aggregate values from there, and then you import it into your aggregate database. Uh, I think what we're generally seeing as the best approach um, in most cases is to actually first do the aggregation within your tracker instance so that you actually have your aggregate data in the tracker instance and then do a sort of a plain aggregate to aggregate transfer later. Um, so a couple of reasons for this um, is that you then have some of the benefits of having your aggregate data in the tracker instance in terms of the analytics performance, in terms of the additional uh, options for doing analytics. Uh, and you also avoid, at least in the first step, to deal with the uh, organ sync issues. So then you're sort of 
separating this into one step where you don't have to deal with log units, then of course you still need to do that as you're moving the aggregate data later. Uh, the disadvantage in addition to <laughs> dealing with organisms later is that you then need to have your aggregate metadata in two places and keep those in sync. Uh, so I'll just say a little bit about uh, the less technical and more sort of implementation side of this. Uh, if any of you have attended uh, some of the tracker academies, you might recognize the figure on the right there. Uh, so this is uh, in terms of integrating your tracker data with uh, an aggregate reporting system like an HMIS. And there are a few, of course, then you need to do the tracker to aggregate to actually do this integration, but there are a few challenges. Uh, one thing we're seeing is that Often when you have this pre-routine HMIS monthly reporting forms um, and you have a tracker program covering more or less the same area, it's typically not complete. So if you're thinking of uh, immunization, you might get all your vaccine children immunized under one above one from tracker. But in the monthly reporting form on immunization, you would typically also have some other information on uh, community outreach sessions and maybe IFI, uh, maybe you have your stock data. So even though you have tracker and you can partially uh, replace your routine aggregate reporting, it's often not complete. Uh, and the other thing which I already talked a bit about is that you might not have the same geographical coverage for tracker as you do for your HMIS. So maybe you have to do uh, both in parallel. There's also all these decisions that needs to be made uh, on how you do the tr data transfer from aggregate to tracker. Uh, so how often should you do it? Uh, should you do it uh, daily, weekly, monthly? Uh, should you update data for the last three months, only the last month, last year, in terms of uh, harmonizing tracker and aggregate? Uh, many countries want to have a way of locking uh, the aggregate data after a certain period, but then how do you do, if you know that you have updates to your case-based data, how do you sort of uh, align that? Uh, similar type of questions in terms of the data quality. What if you have a process of sort of reviewing the quality of your tracker data, uh, and you also have a routine of uh, generating your aggregate reporting from tracker? How do you sort of harmonize that? You might do updates to your tracker data after you produce your aggregate data. Um, what if when you're looking at your aggregate data, you realize there must be something off with my tracker data? How do you go back and uh, sort that out? Uh, and then there's also the big question of completeness and timeliness of reporting, which is sort of a key data quality metric in the aggregate domain. But how do you know when your uh, tracker data is complete. Uh, then there's the question of data access and ownership. You might have one set of users uh, entering your tracker data. What happens when this is uh, aggregated and becomes part of the sort of routine aggregate reporting flow? Who owns that data? Is it the people entering the tracker data? Is it the people responsible for the aggregate data? Uh, and how do you make sure that people actually have access to the data they should have access to, in particular when you're dealing with two different instances? Uh, it's also important to keep in mind that uh, if you're sort of transitioning from having aggregate reporting to having case-based reporting, you would typically need to have a transition period where you're doing both in parallel for a while. Um, and comparing the numbers you get in through tracker with what you're getting in through aggregate. And they probably will never be exactly identical, uh, but at least looking, comparing the numbers, looking at the discrepancies uh, needs to be part of some sort of discussion on when you think you're ready to um, end the parallel aggregate reporting and go fully over to relying on your case-based data. Yeah, then 
which I already touched upon uh, several times. I think this whole issue of making sure that you keep the whole configuration uh, in sync is something you need to take into account. Uh, also at the moment, since uh, like I said, we don't have this built into DHIS2 fully. So you need to have a tool outside DHIS2 for doing the actual migration. Someone needs to be able to configure that, maintain that, keep it up to date in addition to DHIS2 itself. Um, and there may be changes to DHIS2 that you need to uh, take into account, et cetera. So some of this will improve in the next few versions when there is more of this built into core, but it won't be completely uh, gone. Just a quick note on the, these metadata packages uh, that you've probably heard about earlier in the week. Um, we're trying as far as possible there to include the mapping between the aggregate and the tracker uh, as, as far as possible. So for example, for um, the TB packages for uh, surveillance and the aggregate TB packages, we'll already have um, a mapping based on codes from tracker program indicators to the aggregate data elements. And with that, I give the word to Claude, who will talk uh, about this uh, tool that the interoperability team has developed for data migration. Oh, I guess there it is. Don't care. <laughs> All right. Can you hear me? Ah, good. All right. Ah. All right. Um, yes. Hello, everyone. So, I, yes, I'm Claude. I am the software engineer who contributed to this tool. I think it was Shatura from HISP Sri Lanka who started with this and then I took over. Uh, so, yes, the tracker to aggregate tool, uh, T2A, we call it in short. Um, so yeah, if you see the two here, the sign T2A, that means uh, this is the Java application, which we use to uh, pull the export, the program indicators from the HS2 and push, it, and push them back up as data value sets. It's to the same instance, okay? It's not across different instances of the HS2, it's the same instance. Um, yes, so I'm mentioning Java because it's important. You need to have Java installed in the machine where you're gonna run this application. Um, and you see this funny icon here, the clock, because it's a, it's a batch job. So it's gonna run every so often. Of course, you can configure the time and so on. So one of the reasons why you would, you want, to, you would want to use this tool is to avoid the state, which uh, can I get a show of hands? Whoever got like a timeout from a dash, oh, wow, okay. <laughs> more, much more than expected. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, so to avoid the states, uh, endless spinning circle in the dashboard, an unhappy user, a crying user in this case, and, um, uh, and probably an overloaded DHS2 server, which can have an impact on other operations. So yeah, we should try to avoid as much as possible the states. Now, before you run this tool, there are a number of steps which you need to follow. DHS2 configuration steps. Uh, as all I've said, um, the metadata, some metadata packages um, have these steps already configured. Uh, I tried to come up with a clever acronym for this, but I really couldn't. So I mean, if you have <laughs> some way how to abbreviate this and make it like, easy to memorize, <laughs> let me know. So uh, yeah, you need to create a uh, PI attribute, a PI attribute, create as well aggregate data elements for the relevant program indicators, map the relevant, the applic applicable program indicators to the aggregate data elements, which you created in the previous step. And finally, assign the program indicators to a PI group, which could exist already, or you could create one just for this uh, scenario. Uh, yes, step one, step two, and step three are 
and some meta some metadata packages are already set up. Uh, so that's actually some work you don't have to do. Okay, let's go very briefly through each step. I'm gonna try to make this short because I know it's kind of late in the afternoon and concentration is not at the best. <laughs> um, so the first step, create a program indicator attribute. Um, yes, you go into the maintenance uh, section of DHS2, click on attributes, uh, create attribute, and you can just, yeah, it, um, create a PI attribute. So you attach an attribute to the PI. Um, I hope that everyone is familiar with the screen, uh, more or less. So that's the first step, very easy. Uh, just take note of the description because we're gonna see it in the next screen. I wish I had a laser pointer, but I don't, okay. The second step is to create an aggregate data element. So this aggregate data element will be used later on to map to the PI, to the program indicator. Uh, so in this case, we created an ag aggregate data element with the, with the code CVC EIR, EIR AGG PPL first dose. Keep in mind this code because it's gonna be used in the next step. Uh, and yes, the domain type should be aggregate. So I'm not sure why, <laughs> maybe you'll have, <laughs> I don't know if it makes a difference if you set it as count or, or, or tracker actually, it should be aggregate, I guess, yeah. Yeah, the domain type. Okay, all right, all right. Next step is to map the program indicator to ag aggregate data element. As you can see here, we are referencing the code. Um, so the code here, it's, uh, uh, it's from here, the same code. Very important to use the code, not the name, the code. And just, yeah. And the final step in the configuration, in DHS2 configuration, is to assign the program indicator to a group. Now this could be a new group which you created or an existing one. Uh, you will see later on that we reference the, gr the group ID from the tracker to aggregate two. And those are the four steps. Um, I'm gonna repeat. Some of these set steps are already were done for you in the metadata packages. All right. So let's get into the specifics, the logistics of this, how to run this tool. Uh, you go onto our DHS2 GitHub page, type T2A, there's the link over there actually, but if you want, yeah, type T2A, and the first result that comes up, just click on it, it's the repository. Uh, yeah. Go to the releases page and download the latest uh, Java archive, the jar. Uh, yes, you can see that I'm, that guy there is, by the way, <laughs> the contributor. Okay, once you download it, and assuming that you have Java installed, installed into the machine where you're gonna run it, uh, you can run it in this manner. Uh, now, yes, this is, a, this is actually, um, I hope everyone can see the parameters from there. Uh, let me know if it's hard to see. Uh, yes, so this is, this is the, the minimum number of parameters you need to run the tracker to aggregate to. Uh, the DHS2 API URL, which is the API and web, the API endpoint for the web, for the, the DHS2 web API. Uh, the username, the API username and password, the application the job will run as. Uh, probably this will change into, a, into an API token in the next version because it is the recommended way to, to uh, log in to authenticate against the HS2. The org unit level. These are the, uh, the programmer 
the program indicators uh, for the org units, for the level of the org unit hierarchy, uh, the tracker to aggregate will export. Uh, so this actually, yeah, in this, in this case, we're, or we're exporting the program indicators for the third level of the org, org unit hierarchy, which could be, I guess, the facility, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> Uh, same goes for the periods is the uh, for which periods the program indicators will be exported. Uh, it can accept multiple periods. It can they can be absolute, they can be relative, and they need to be comma delimited. And finally is the PI group ID, the program indicator group ID, which we saw earlier on. Uh, yeah, you, think, uh, you need to take a note of the ID of the group ID. And these are all the program indicators in that group will be exported. And voila, that's it. That's how you can run it. Some other optional parameters. This is a job, okay? So it's gonna run every so often. So with that in mind, you can schedule the time it's going to run. Uh, I think this is midnight, but my micron is not that good. So. Anyway, <laughs> there is like a website where you can um, convert the time to cron to cron expressions. Uh, I found that very useful. You can also kick off manually the job if you need to. So you can hit the application via HTTP, via web browser. And you can also um, specify the address the job is listening on. Very importantly, please don't leave this exposed to the outside world. Don't leave the, this application exposed to the outside world. It needs to be behind uh, an HTTP gateway like Nginx, for example. You don't leave it like exposed because, <laughs> uh, yes, some very nasty things can happen otherwise. Like you can have someone just kicking off the job every time and overload your server. Now, yes, overloading. Um, this job can take a very long time to run by default. And we do that on purpose actually, so that, that we don't overload the server, the DHS to server or kill it. Uh, so by default, it can take a long time to complete. It depends of course on the number of uh, track entity instances that you have and how complicated the PI expressions are and how many PIs you have and how many periods as well you have, as well as org units. So in, in order to reduce the runtime, the job time, we have provided a parameter called org unit batch size. And with, with this, you can reduce the chattiness, the network uh, communication going on between tracker to aggregate and DHS to server. Less network communication, faster runtime usually. <laughs> so here you can see an example where we're using one org unit batch size one. That means that we're exporting a PI for each org unit once. And here we have org unit batch size two. That means we're, uh, we're, we're exporting a program, um, program indicators for uh, two units, two org units every time for every iteration. You can add as much as you want, but be careful that, that you can kill the server like this. So please don't run this on production, test it first, see that it scales well, and then you can, yeah, try it on prod, I'll run it on prod. <laughs> kind of the same thing, but for periods. Uh, yes, actually I forgot what the slide is about. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> Uh, for periods, uh, by default, split periods is set to true. So that means it's going to export a PI for each period, but once for every network request, network message. If you set it to false, it's gonna aggregate the, the requests into, uh, into one where it's, it batches the, the periods. Uh, again, you would use this to optimize the runtime, to reduce the runtime. 
as I said, be careful, test it first, make sure you don't kill the server. And then yeah, once it's, if it scales well, run it on prod. There are other, yeah, there are many more other, actually there are a few more other parameters. I'm not going into them because I don't want you to doze off. <laughs> uh, but you can find the documentation, the readme file, it's in the GitHub repo of the, of the tracker to aggregate. And, and there's the blog as well. If you go onto the DHS2 blog, I go basically what I, what I explained here, what I explained there much better and, to, and with, um, with more detail. Okay, <laughs> that's it. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, on, only one uh, slide left, which is the roadmap uh, for doing some of this within the uh, DHIS2 core. Uh, so, the plan is that the sort of backend functionality for doing the tracker to aggregate data transfer. So basically what the, the tool you just saw uh, is doing is according to Lars uh, for 239. So that's the backend functionality. Uh, when there will be a UI for doing this uh, is to be confirmed. Uh, and the plan is that uh, sort of configuring this mappings between the tracker and aggregate. Um, that will be done through a new metadata object basically in the, for DHIS2. So you have configurations that are metadata objects which you can import export uh, into DHIS2. Um, so sort of self-contained um, elements. So what the benefits will be of doing this within the core uh, is first of all that it's running internally so it should sort of uh, automatically be more performant because you're not going uh, via the API via the network. Uh, this means that you can schedule these tracker to aggregate jobs as part of the DHS2 um, scheduler where you also schedule analytics runs etc. <coughs> It also makes it uh, possible to run this sort of by automatically in parallel. Um, some of what Claude was talking about, these batch sizes, et cetera, and doing more, more at the same time. Uh, this can be done then within this uh, feature in DHIS2. Uh, the plan is to have some auto partitioning of uh, the program indicators. So doing the same again with the batches. If you have a configuration with 200 program indicators, the system will then take care of separating those into smaller uh, jobs. Finally, this means that um, sort of dealing with authentication, et cetera, will not have to be done outside of DHIS2. That will be part of the configuration. So this, this functionality in DHIS2 will actually both support doing this with only, within one instance and also doing it from one instance to another. So there you have the possibility of doing it uh, across instances in one uh, operation. So then you would need a, then you would need the passwords for sort of your target um, DHIS2 system. That's the plan. Any questions to any of this? If you're still alive. <laughs> Really uh, excited for this because yeah, I've been doing similar stuff. So it's exciting to see it getting a proper tool. Um, the last time I asked, there wasn't any support for attribute option combos in the T2A tool. So it was only splitting by category option combos. Is there, do you know when that's going to be available as part of the tool? Yes, uh, I was actually going to implement it this week, but I was <laughs> busy at the conference, so it's going to probably be next <laughs> next week. <laughs> Great, thanks. <laughs> thanks.
Thank you. Um, I, I totally understand the benefits from combining tracker with um, aggregated data, but uh, my question would be, do you see benefit of using this, just converting tracker data to improve the speed or efficiency in the dashboards? Do you think uh, that's gonna be something Yeah. yeah, so I think this is, uh, yes, relevant. If you have like a large scale tracker and you don't have any aggregate system you're integrating with, I think this is still useful because the pre-aggregating the data in the aggregate analytics is more efficient than doing the program indicators based on the aggregate tracker analytics. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yes, you would run it off peak hours, ideally. Uh, but yes, all of said, the advantage is you're running it once. You're not exporting the PIs every time you load the dashboard. And then, yeah. of course, actually, that's one slide I should have added. Then you would load from the yes in the dashboard. You would load the uh, the aggregate data element instead of the PI. Uh, yeah. yeah. So essentially, that doing this aggregate to track tracker aggregate means that you're only exporting this uh, program indicator once for each org unit and period, instead of every time someone opens a dashboard or uh, chooses that program indicator in analytics. Yeah, a, a quick one. I, I think you did talk about data elements, aggregate data elements. You are mapping data, data aggregate data elements, but we are dealing now with the category combos. So does that also apply for the category combos? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that it's actually uh, in the program indicators. Uh, that's actually one of the built-in attributes of the program indicators. Is called category option combo for export. And there's also one attribute option combo for export. So that's sort of a, that's part of the program indicators. Whilst for uh, the attribute for defining the data element that you're exporting to is not built into the program indicator. So that you need to set up as a custom attribute. And there is a reason for it, but I don't remember exactly what, but uh, something, yeah. A couple of questions from Zoom. Um, so could you talk more about how uh, Apache Camel was used? I mean, I mean, it could be an assembly. It's not really, um, it's not going to make a difference in this case. Um, but yeah, we use uh, Camel. It helps with the performance, with, the, with, the, uh, with split, with, with uh, scaling up, uh, with um, performing the operations. In parallel, for example, you have the split pattern. I have the split operation in Camel, and that's actually very useful because it transparently uh, runs the I don't know the, the operations parallelly instead of in sequence. So that actually, instead of you writing it in plain Java code or whatever, it does it for you. Um, but yeah, <laughs> it's all hidden away, so it's, the user is not gonna, the the administrator is not going to know about it. <laughs> Cool. And the other question was, can you please upload your slides to Sketch? Yes. Excellent. Anyone else? Predictors, John? Yes, you can use, uh, you can do this with predictors. We don't know how it scales. <laughs> you know, tracker to aggregate has been um, used in many times, right? Many variables, many places. Um, it's not new, but like every, we have multiple solutions. So one is just like what you're demonstrating other things. The good thing is that because it's, we are running in the back and sending it as a, a batch, right? So what we did also was is to, we didn't want to use the custom attribute to create the mapping. So we used the predictor to create the mapping. So because in the predictor, you can select where you're getting the data from. And also you can just say, which is the output data items, including category, uh, option combo and all different things. So you can define that. So we use that one as uh, mapping. And then from the external service or the script, we pointed to, to get all the data and push it through exactly the same way. But I'm just like saying, if could have been used, one of the things which I asked about predictor is because of the performance, it was not so good. So that's why it was good to make it outside. So, but storing the mapping, it's it might be a still a good solution. <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah, no, so that's, that was the reason, because uh, like John says, it is possible within a predictor to specify a program indicator as the sort of data source and specify a target data element that you're saving the outputs into. Uh, and the reason we're starting with this whole sort of doing something outside was that the performance wasn't good enough initially. So, and there's been a lot of performance improvements with the predict, uh, predictors in the last couple of versions. So it is possible that that, would also scale then to bigger, but that's not something we've tested uh, for this purpose as far as I know. But I think, uh, yes, you don't have to create the attribute, but then you need to create one predictor for each data element. So it's not like it's effortless and you still need to have some way of doing the mapping. I should also, when talking of the mapping, mention uh, that there is an app on the app app for helping you do the sort of generating the program indicators. Um, when you have like HD segregations, sex segregations. So instead of sort of repeating those program indicator expressions the, uh, again and again, uh, Pete just made an app uh, that is available on App Hub for helping you do the not repeating manually all the generation of the program indicators. Presentation on another, oh yeah. Uh, yeah, it's called the Program Dataset Connector app. Um, so you can find it on the App Hub um, to do that. Set the metadata mapping up and then it already used, it creates program indicator groups. So the output of the app basically plugs into the input of this tool quite nicely. Uh, so yeah. Final question. Okay, then I guess uh, we're done. <laughs>